Now joining me is pollster Frank Luntz, wildly hailed as the man who has had his finger on the American public's pulse. He is a communications pro, a GOP strategist, and we're going to get into a lot of political talk about what's on the mind of the electorate and what messages are getting through for the good and the bad for politicians with 2016 in their sights. Thanks for coming, Frank. Thank you. I hope that they wash their hands, because if I have my finger on their pulse, that's kind of... <laughs> As a communications pro, what do you make of ISIS's success with social media? It's so smart and so evil at the same time. Uh, fortunately, most Americans won't look at these horrific videos, but they have cut through and they've created a fear that I haven't seen since 9-11. The public genuinely is frightened. Now, understand that only a few Americans have been killed, although the fact that a few Americans have been executed this way is significant. But it is a fear, it is deep, it is emotional, and the public is looking to Washington to remove that fear, and they are so frustrated that nothing seems to be happening. Is the fear that ISIS is going to attack us? Is that What is the fear? It's not that. It's the idea that it is so random, so final, so vicious, so inhumane, so graphic, so ugly, so beyond anything that we're used to. Just as 9-11 was significant and will never go away, you had Pearl Harbor and you had 9-11. ISIS is, is buried, burrowed deep in our psyche that we can't control it. And that is something that Americans aren't used to. And can any president, Obama, any president, do something about ISIS? The question is, what created ISIS? And did you understand it while it was being created? I think the president wishes, deeply wishes, that he could take back ISIS's junior varsity. <laughs> because ISIS, if they were in the NCAAs, they would, they would be the champion next weekend. Um, it's the ingredients that create this horrific threat that matter. Number one, how do you respond when an American ha is decapitated? Number two, what do you say to your allies in terms of bringing them along in a fight? Number three, how do you treat your enemies? And is it, is it clear that they are enemies? And number four, what is your not just short-term plan for dealing with it, but your long-term plan so this doesn't happen again? But as the previous guest said, there's no solid answer when you're talking about the Middle East. No, there isn't, and there's enough blame to go around with everyone. But why is it that it just seems like we are treating our allies with disrespect, and I mean Israel, and we are treating our enemies, and I mean Iran, with way too much respect, that I am concerned, and the public agrees with this. By the way, uh, Bibi Netanyahu may be the most controversial Israeli prime minister ever, but the American people actually support his position on Iran than they do the man that they elected president, Barack Obama. And the reason why is that we believe that adding any nuclear capabilities to the Middle East, no matter what country has it, is going to make us more unstable more insecure. But isn't Obama trying to prevent that? The argument that's being made, and I'm a public opinion person, and I'm very careful not to go into policy, but the argument that's being made is that if you allow Iran any nuclear capabilities whatsoever, which they now have, and they're moving forward, that that is actually destabilizing. And as your previous guest said, that that's not good for Saudi Arabia, it's not good for Jordan, it's not good for anyone. January 2014, a profile of you in the Atlantic, you were quoted as describing Americans the focus groups that you check with impose their opinions rather than expressing them. You said political contentiousness was different than it ever has been. Why? It's the reason why I like doing this. It's the reason why I've followed you my whole life. It's the reason why you don't even know this, but in 1980, I called into your radio show <laughs> and you put me on the air. And somehow your producer needs to find that. Uh, I was one of the people who got to respond after the presidential debate, and I was a child, I was a kid, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. You are always civil. You are always respectful. You ask interesting, probing, often tough questions, but you do so with a decency. That is gone in America today. It doesn't exist. And someone like me who grew up being just as aggressive as what's happening around me now, the truth is, as I've aged, I've become more I've become quieter. I will still be provocative, but I try to do so in a respectful way. And the American people just hate what's going on right now.
Look, it's why, it's why Congress has a 12% job approval rating. Gaddafi had a 17% job <laughs> approval rating, and that was among the people who killed him. <laughs> what is instant response? You pioneered this. What is it? It is a dial device that is about the size of a remote control, and you turn it up or down based on whether you agree or disagree, based on whether you want to support or oppose the candidate. And it measures your reactions on a second-by-second -second basis. And who do you give it to? I give it to anyone who wants it. And it's not a partisan device. The device can't tell whether a Republican or Democrat is operating So how many it. people have it when they're, uh, like... It's typical sessions, anywhere from 30 to 40 people. I've done as many as 200 people at a time. And what's special about this is it's like an EKG. And it measures exactly what you're thinking and exactly how you're feeling. So when you do a speech, let's say Obama's State of the Union address, people forget how they felt at minute five when the speech is over. But the dials record it in real time, and so I can go back and figure out what words work, what phrases work, and even the presentation of people. And you know if the person holding it is a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent? They have registered questions like their age, their gender, their ethnicity, uh, and their partisanship. So I can break it down that way. And I did you, by the way. You don't even know this. This is like, I should do a, a, a one of these, Larry King, This Is Your Life. I did you because of your suspenders, and I wanted to see how people reacted to them. And to my surprise, because I wasn't, I'm not a fan, I'm not a fan of ties or suspenders, they actually do well for you. <laughs> and they do well for you because it's your signature, it's your mark, and it's who you are. And the thing that people dial highest are things that are authentic and genuine. Hmm. Thank you, Frank. All right, we have an example of instant response. The first involves Hillary Clinton. First, when I got to work as Secretary of State, I opted for convenience to use my personal email account, which was allowed by the State Department, because I thought it would be easier to carry just one device for my work and for my personal emails instead of two. Looking back, it would have been better if I simply used a second email account and carried a second phone, but at the time, this didn't seem like an issue. Second, the vast majority of my work emails went to government employees at their government addresses, which meant they were captured and preserved immediately on the system at the State Department. Now, we found out that that's not true after that press conference happened. And I don't know if your producers can do this, but I want to point out three things about that clip. Number one is that she does this. And I don't know who she's looking at. Because if you've ever been to a press conference, there's nobody up there. And there's nobody up there. She's not looking you straight in the eye. She's not looking at the reporters. She's reading, and she it's... Almost but the like, Democrats were acting a little favorably, and the Republicans were acting less favorably. At the end, they were almost equal. The Democrats were neutral. They were not favorable. And the Republicans were hostile because they don't believe it. And part of not believing it is looking someone straight in the eye. You know when you have guests on your show, yeah. and they've done something controversial, and they spend their time down here, you know Push. that they're nervous. She couldn't look anyone straight in the eye. That's point number one. Point number two is you have to be accurate in what you say. And people don't believe that what she's saying is what happened. So Hillary could learn from that, right? Hillary has to learn from that. It's the reason why she didn't win against Barack Obama in 2008. The moment, the, her strongest moment in the campaign is when she was speaking and her voice cracked and she almost cried. And if you remember, she was losing in New Hampshire and she came back because of it. She doesn't need to prove strength. She's got it already. She doesn't need to prove leadership. People see her as a leader. They may disagree, but they see her as a leader. What she needs to prove is humanity, that she feels, that she has emotions. That people don't see, and that's important for her. Her husband could do that. Oh, her husband's the best at it. The best. Bill Clinton felt your pain. <laughs> now, he caused it, but at least he felt it while he was causing it. And if he did a little less feeling, then he would have not have been in the trouble that he's in. But that's for another show. Another instant response, actually. This one on Jeb Bush. Let's watch. If we want to build confidence and trust of the American position, we have to listen. Foreign policy should be a place where our long-term security interests are front and center. And the political hacks should be doing the campaigns and staying there. We should strive to make it bipartisan again. A president needs to set a strategy to be clear about it, not overcommit or overpromise, but always strive to deliver. 
two points there. He was doing well with the Democrats. He did well. Now, number one is when he talked about bipartisanship, the Republicans want none of it. Let's be honest. <laughs> Republicans don't like this president, don't want to work with Democrats, they have a different point of view. Now, he also read his speech, and for him to be effective, he's going to have to be able to deliver it from the heart. And he's been governor for eight years. He's been in the political system for 25. It shouldn't be difficult for him. But the other thing was at least he would look out. At least there was eye contact. At least you felt like he was in full control of his material. It's good. It's not great. But he will need to be much more give and take in the future. What would you bet their debates will be like? Well, the one that I really want to see, just from a debate perspective, is Chris Christie versus Hillary Clinton. You know Bill's going to be giving Christie advice. Yeah, here, here's how you really get at her. And every time Christie will hammer her, people will be going, yeah. The problem is, it'll be the worst thing for the GOP. Chris Christie... Don't hammer her. You create a victim. And Chris Christie is just too loud. He's too in your face. But is he in the picture now? I still think he is. Look, I was called in the New York Times as saying that Chris Christie should run. But I didn't mean run for president. I just meant run. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I guess not. You're funny, Frank. Uh, you've got a few more in instant response samples. These focus on two men favored by the conservative wing. Let's watch. What makes America great? What makes us exceptional? What makes us arguably the greatest country in the history of the world is that in moments of crisis, be it economic or fiscal, be it military or spiritual, there have been men and women throughout our history who have stood up and made decisions that think more about the future of their children and their grandchildren than they did about their own political futures. Ladies and gentlemen here tonight, this is one of those moments in American history. There is a problem in Washington, and the problem is bigger than a continuing resolution. It's bigger than Obamacare. It's even bigger than the budget. The most fundamental problem, the frustration, is that the men and women in Washington aren't listening. If you talk to the man and woman on the street, that's the, that's the, the message you hear over and over again. Why don't they listen to me? Why don't they hear what we have to say? They aren't listening to the millions of people, Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians across the spectrum who say our elected officials, they get to Washington and they stop listening to the people. Number one political soundbite of the 2016 era was that by Ted Cruz. Because you don't have to be a Republican, independent Democrat. Yeah, but uh, they're not saying anything. They don't, oh, we've always said that. They don't listen to me. But he says it in a way that people believe it. Now, I don't think he's the nominee, <laughs> but I want to tell you that that language, that rhetoric is very powerful. And for Scott Walker, what did you notice about him? No jacket, sleeves rolled up, no teleprompter, no notes. He spoke from the heart. Yeah, but also he said that his, how would he handle foreign affairs? His ability, because he was an Eagle Scout, would help him send men into war. Well, now, that's a riot. He's, he's going to need to get his responses much more crisp to questions like that. And Mr. Cruz applies for Obamacare. Okay, clearly you're reading <laughs> the, the talking points right there. No, I haven't read a thing. In fact, I can see the Democratic National Committee logo on the very top no, no, of no, your No, 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 I'm asking two questions about two candidates that never made sense to me. In, in fact, I see a little note saying, Larry, love you, Hillary. Where did you come up with that? I love Jeb Bush. Jeb, Really? Oh, I'm an old friend of Jeb Bush from Miami days. I, I take no stand in this, by the way. What's interesting for, for Jeb, and I'm going to give you a positive and a negative, is that you don't want to be the third Bush versus the first woman. That is not a good context for Jeb. However, as governor of Florida, and I don't know if you were down there when he was governor, he did a tremendous job on education. He did a tremendous job with hospitals. He did a tremendous job with the economy. He was really one of America's best governors. And yet some of the things that he did as governor, he's now being criticized for. By the right. By the right. So Jay's going to have to navigate that, which is very tough. So you're the GOP strategist. Who's in the, is Bush in the lead? Uh, Bush is in the money lead. And Bush is the Mitt Romney of this campaign. That's he, why Mitt pulled out. He's going to have more money than God. He'll have more money than you, Larry. <laughs> and, and Scott <laughs> Walker is the... Well, almost as much. You won't have to give him a loan. If Jeb Bush comes to you and says, Larry, I need a donation, tell him 
go ask the next guy. As Luntz. Uh, Scott, no. Scott yeah. Walker is the language lead of the candidates. And Marco Rubio, who we haven't talked about, is actually the best messenger for the GOP. Ted Cruz gets the most standing ovations. Rand Paul has the most support of first and second time voters. So there's something really for everyone, except for Bobby Jindal. There's like nothing for him. But everybody else has got a rationale for why they could eventually win the nomination. I think it's going to be one of the best campaigns of our time. Really? Yeah. The primaries and the, the election. The election, because, and, and the tragedy of it is how negative it's going to be. And that... The, Are there, is the Republican primary going to be very negative? They're doing everything they can to prevent it. As you know, there's one debate starting in August. There's one debate every month. So instead of having 40 debates, there's only going to be eight or nine of them as the primary goes forward. And they're doing everything they can so candidates don't destroy each other. But this is politics. It's what they do. But whenever you've got a campaign with, uh, with the former first lady, well, I don't know what we call her. We call her Secretary Clinton, Senator Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Mrs. I think Clinton. It, it depends on what Adlai Stevenson was asked would he would like to be called ambassador. He said he always wanted to be called governor. So I think you ask her, what is her preference? And she had many posts. What is the one you'd like to be called? It's her preference. And But her campaigns have always been tough, always been... Uh, negative. And so I think the Republicans have to be prepared that whatever we saw in 2012 is nothing compared to what we'll see in 2016. I really think they're going to go at each other. You do? Yeah, and the stakes are so high. Should, would, would Hillary benefit from a primary opponent? Yes. It'll make her a sharper candidate. She should not have lost in 2008. In Iowa, when she came in, I guess, second, in Iowa, she was beating Barack Obama by 40 points on caucus day. Moved to New Hampshire eight days later. She was beating Obama nationwide by 19 points. She barely won New Hampshire. Now moved to Super Tuesday. She's still up by 10 points, and yet Obama gets more delegates. She wasn't a good candidate. The fact is there are four states that really matter, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. And she has to be able to do retail politics in those states, to be able to engage you, to be able to make people laugh, to make people want her, not just respect her. And that's tough. Would you want Obama to campaign? Oh, good question. Uh, in a Democratic primary, yes. But I would want him nowhere in the general election. And I would want Bill Clinton to campaign, but Bill Clinton sometimes is her best friend, and at other times, he was her worst enemy. You were a consultant to the West Wing, right? Yes, for about a year and a half. And that was a Democratic administration. Uh, it was the American... For those who did not like George W. Bush, that was the administration. And it, I, I enjoyed it because it was fun to watch. Uh, I love Veep. And I tell people who are interested in politics, watch it because there's a similarity. I love Newsroom. And I know conservatives didn't. Yeah. I thought Aaron Sorkin's Newsroom was one of the best shows on television. To be a good pollster, I want to get this in before we close. Yep. You have to be dispassionate, right? I and mean, that, you, you have to take, you have to be up, you, you have to tell the guy you're not doing well. Yes, and I've never had a problem doing that. And in fact, it has helped me nine times out of ten. People know me as being very blunt. This is why I developed the sense of humor. Because it's easier to tell someone they suck when they're laughing with you than it is when they're angry at you. And I don't want to get fired. I don't want to lose my job. But if you can't look someone in the eye and say, you know what, that speech wasn't good. This is what I will tell a CEO or a senator or a prime minister. If you don't tell the truth, you don't deserve the income, you don't deserve the job, and you don't deserve the opportunity. And I've lost a few jobs because of it, but I've gotten a lot more. And that's why I like doing this. I get a chance to tell the truth. Thank you. Always great being with you, Frank. Thank you. We want to call on you a lot in the next uh, 15, Happy to do it. 20 months.